of the secrets of meditation. Well, it's not really a secret. You just call something a secret to make it better, more exciting. But one of the one of the secrets of meditation is uh, <clears throat> the art of noticing things that aren't there. And uh, noticing what's absent and uh, we just uh, <clears throat> talking about that today in the monastery I got a, one of my favorite books uh, on the origin of consciousness and uh, it has a very powerful uh, series of images uh, from ancient Mesopotamia one image it shows uh, the king talking to the god and the king and the god are there straight next to each other the, king, the god sitting in a chair the king standing at, at the same eye level staring at each other face to face right there very present and then the next image comes from a few centuries later and very strikingly different quite amazing the god now is absent the chair is empty and the king is represented in two images. <clears throat> First image, he's standing as he was in the earlier image, staring at, at the eye, eye level where the god should be but isn't. And then in the second, the king's represented twice, once standing and then in front of him, the same king represented but now kneeling. And so that seems to be perhaps one of the earliest images of, of the actual adopting the posture of kneeling and especially very remarkable for a, uh, a great mighty warrior as this king was to be adopting such a posture of humility and abasement as to be kneeling so very very remarkable implications of these images but one of the things that it draws your attention to is the absence the absence of what the absence of the God however you want to interpret this there are many different ways of, of looking at it but <clears throat> uh, certainly what they're trying to convey is some kind of impression of change the king itself represented in two images moving images it's almost like the first cartoon the first moving picture the one in one position and then the other position and I think that's very deeply symbolic. When we, when we come to um, <clears throat> uh, a religious practice, whether it be Buddhism or whatever it might be, uh, the first thing we want to do is to fill our mind with things. And we want to learn about the particular religion. We want to learn the facts, the dates, and so on. We want to learn who was the Buddha and where did he live, what did he do, and uh, so on. What did he teach? And uh, we want to learn about what these teachings are. And we, we have this kind of thirst to, uh, to, to get closer to and to confront. So we want, we're like the first image. We want to actually see face-to-face -face that uh, image of the God or the other. But of course the more we look into it, the more we, we uh, try to see that and to investigate it, to understand it, the more we realize how ephemeral it all is. How uh, trying to understand the Buddha in that way can never be truly satisfying. Trying to understand what the Buddha's teachings are through confronting the, the outward expression, the show of those things is never uh, truly going to get to the essence of what those things are. And so <clears throat> the God, as it were, disappears. That, that Buddha that we thought, that we knew, the Buddha that we thought that we could worship, the Buddha that we thought we could revere, the Buddha of myth and legend, 
whether that be ancient traditional myths or whether that be modern myths, because in modern times, of course, we also construct our own myths of what the Buddha is or what Buddhism is. And these are no less uh, determined and shaped by our culture, our time, and so on, than any other kind of myth is. We just don't notice the shaping because it suits us. It's our own color, our own flavor, our own shape, our own style. And so we don't notice how deeply conditioned that is. So the more we look at these things, the more we go into it, the further they, they kind of recede from us. Things that we took for granted, then they go further and further away from us the more we know about it. And uh, this is something my father encapsulated this very nicely for me when I was growing up. He'd, he'd always say, a uh, quote is saying, a little learning is a dangerous thing. And that was mainly to, to uh, when he was um, chastising me for pretending that I knew more than I really did. And he would say uh, something like that, a little learning is... It was one of the great sayings I learned from my father. One of them was, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Another one was, don't boil your cabbages twice. which is, makes a lot of sense, okay? And if you don't believe it, then try it out. Go home and, and uh, boil up some cabbages and then boil it again and it, it won't be good, I'll tell you right now. And uh, anyway, I'm sure there are many other wise things that he taught me, but they're the only ones I can think of for now. Uh, so... The other thing he taught me that I always remembered was from uh, French philosopher Rousseau. He said, man is um, born free but is everywhere in chains. <coughs> this is one of the, the famous sayings from the, the uh, European Enlightenment era. Man is born free but is everywhere in chains. Actually, I think from a Buddhist point of view, it's more the opposite way around, isn't it? We're born in chains. But somehow, this is what's curious about Buddhism and, and about spiritual practice. Even though we're born in chains, we're born somehow into our own situation of suffering, aging and death. And, and yet somehow we still yearn to be free. I find this very, very mysterious. Why is it that even though all we've ever known is servitude, all we've ever known is enslavement to our desires and to the suffering of our lives and entrapment in this world and yet somehow there's something in us that's calling us to something else calling us to freedom I find this very mysterious anyway get back to the topic of the talk, a little learning is a dangerous thing. So, so this is what happens when we, we uh, get the, we think we have the truth kind of wrapped up, we think we know all the answers. And uh, of course that stops us from being able to learn, stops us from being able to grow as soon as we think we know the answer. And so this is why we often find that people who have uh, little knowledge of something uh, are very uh, strident in their, their expression of their opinions about that. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, they're kind of insisting on this must be the, true and every, the truth and everything else is false. But, of course, the people who have a lot of knowledge about them are always much more cautious. And this is, of course, one of the great hallmarks of uh, anybody who's really an expert and has a deep knowledge of their field, whatever the field is, or science or humanities or anything, that those who really know what they're talking about are always very cautious about how they express themselves. And so again, this is, if you like, symbolized and encapsulated in this idea of the disappearing God. First of all, he's there, 
but then the more you're there, the more you're watching, somehow he vanishes. And in that moment, then the king kneels down. The god disappears, the king kneels down. So in that moment, there's that like in that, 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 that captures that moment of humility, or is it that moment of letting go? Previously, the king and the god knew each other; they were mates. Okay, and there's a very kind of intimate relationship. They're just talking to each other, just like we're talking here and now. Suddenly, the god has gone, and so the king realizes somehow. <clears throat> there's a sense of loss. Somehow there's a, there's a sense of doubt. Who am I? Maybe I'm not the center of the world anymore. Maybe I'm not going to live forever. Maybe I'm not uh, the source of all power. And so there's that sense of humility, descending, kneeling. And in, in that act of kneeling, then we can guess or, 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 or imagine that... On the one hand, like a, 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 like a, a, a self-emptying, like a deflation of the king, where his own ego and, and uh, sense of pride in his position was being let go. So in a sense of diminishing, but also an expansion at the same time in the sense of uh, opening himself up to more of a sense of wonder, like opening himself up to a sense of of, of, of realizing that he needed that, whatever it was, that spiritual support, that nourishment. Almost like a beseeching or a begging. And so this is where we can imagine the idea of prayer comes from. Almost like begging for that kind of support, the feeling that we need that kind of support. But all that's there is an empty chair. So an empty chair is very suggestive. An empty chair creates a space. So it suggests the presence of something, but doesn't actually define what that thing is. And that's very poignant in the Buddhist context because as many of you may know, if you know a little bit about Buddhist history, all of the early Buddhist iconography all their sculptures from you know, the first 500 years or so of Buddhism, all of them uh, didn't represent the Buddha with an image. Okay? And so this is the absence of the Buddha from uh, all the early sculptures and artworks in Buddhism is one of the great mysteries of the history of Buddhism. Why is the Buddha not actually represented? And uh, the first images appeared maybe a bit less than 500 years, maybe maybe three, four hundred years after the Buddha. And uh, <clears throat> up until that time, the Buddha was represented only with symbols. So he'd be represented with the empty seat or with the Bodhi tree or with a stupa, uh, a dagaba, uh, or with um, a pair of footprints. And all of these would be regarded as something which would in some way symbolize uh, the Buddha's presence, but also, of course, emphasizing his absence. Yeah? So you're symbolizing his presence, but also symbolizing his absence. And I think that also tells us something very profound about the nature of the, uh, what it means to be a Buddhist. And uh, as was felt especially uh, in that time of early Buddhism, so just like uh, that poor king, his name Tukulti Ninurta, that was his name, Tukulti Ninurta. And he, his, uh, just as like his god had vanished, and so he expressed the loss of that through his kneeling. So the same way in Buddhism, somehow the Buddha is gone. And so this is uh, sometimes something which is used to attack or criticize Buddhism, as I've heard uh, Christians have told me, you know, the Buddha's dead, he's gone, but Jesus lives. Well, maybe we can discuss this more tomorrow night about the implications of this. And 
So the Buddha's gone, but Jesus lives. So, again, it kind of depends on your perspective, doesn't it? But it's emotionally, like on an emo, you know, intellectual level, we can accept the Buddha lived and he was a man and he died and so on, so that's not a problem. But on an emotional level, there's that kind of absence. And that's felt, I think, very, very strongly in the Buddhist traditions, that we somehow feel that we need that emotional connection with the Buddha. And, and there are many, many surrogates have been invented to, to replace that, like Buddha images, like stories of the Buddha, like uh, using... Uh, you know, people will, will express their devotion, for example, to the Sangha rather than to the Buddha uh, and uh, through doing the chanting and through doing meditations on the Buddha and all of these kinds of things. So in many ways, uh, and of course in the Mahayana schools, then that's made even more um, central, uh, the idea through, through uh, developing this whole pantheon of, of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and so on who are supposed to be present uh, at all times. And so in that way, again, all this movement trying to bring back that presence of the Buddha. So on the one hand, if we focus on what Buddhism is and on what Buddhists do and so on, that's what we talk about. We talk about the, you know, the development of the Buddha images and the iconography. We talk about the different scriptures and what they say. And we talk about how the different Buddhists develop these belief systems and so on. But that's all telling you about the things. It's not telling you about the space. But what all of that implies, to me anyway, is, is this sense of, of, of loss, of, of yearning, which comes from that space, that emotional loss. And so like a movement to try to want to fill those things up. So that's, I think that's quite interesting, isn't it? If... if so all, all of these activities of Buddhism is actually, you know, we call ourselves Buddhism, it's all moving around this empty center, like a cyclone. Yeah? And it's always moving around and around and around, but there's nothing in the middle of it. There's just emptiness in the middle of it. But that emptiness is only defined by the movement of the air, by the storm. And the more violent the storm is, the more active the storm is, then the more clearly defined and the more um, deep is the peace and the stillness that lies at the heart of it. So um, our, our spiritual journey in Buddhism is very much like this. It's very much like we're moving through this storm, through this, these externals yeah, and through all the... the um, the stuff of our lives, the events of our lives, the daily uh, bits, little bits of trivia and dukkha and so on that, that make up our day. Walking along the footpath, looking at old chewing gum. You see, we look at the old chewing gum on the ground, you think, right, that's it. My Dhamma path starts here. Right? So you, what does old chewing gum tells you? Well, it tells you about the power of attachment for a start. <laughs> Isn't that true? So you never, you never thought of that before. But you look, look, there it is. It's teaching you. And you go, you want, somewhere you want the Buddha to come. Everyone, so everyone thinks, oh, I'm going to get reborn in the time of Maitreya Buddha in the future and he's going to teach me. But even a piece of chewing gum can teach you the Dhamma. Yeah? <coughs> what are you waiting for Maitreya to come for? What else can he teach you that a piece of chewing gum can't teach you? Impermanence? Suffering? Not self? And so our, uh, the, 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 the things of our lives, those events that happen in our lives, these are all uh, 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 like creating um, the structures where the Dhamma can take place. But Dhamma itself only happens when there aren't any of those things. And this sounds very mysterious, but actually it's very, very ordinary. Here we are sitting inside this hall here. And, of course, we're sitting in a space. 
It's, it's emptiness, and we can only be here because there's emptiness. But the emptiness is only here because of the things. So the walls, the roof, the floor, these define the space. They create the space. We're using things, and with the things we create the space. And so when we, look in, we come into a hall or into a room, we look at the things there. We look at the floor, we look at the walls, we look at the ceiling. We look at the furniture, the people in the room. We're always looking at the things. But actually what the room is there for is to create space. And without that space, nothing can happen. Nobody can live. Again, we, we always want to, uh, you know, if, we, if you talk about what, what are the conditions for us to live, what do we need to survive? We need air, we need water, we need food, we need a temperature within a certain range, and so on and so forth. So if we ask what do we need to survive, we'd, we'd immediately think of these things. But the first thing we need is space. We need space more than we need any of those things. Even, even if, 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 if we're without space, it would kill us quicker than if we were without air or water. We'd just die instantaneously. If all the space was sucked out between the atoms in our body, we'd just collapse. Nothing. And space is actually the most critical of any element. And yet the hardest to notice, the most subtle of them. <clears throat> this is why I find this image of this empty seat to be very poignant, very moving. And I think we need to, t it's very to reflect on that and to take the same attitude towards our Buddhist practice that, that although, yes, we, we create a sense of devotion uh, as part of our Buddhist practice, so part of our Buddhist practice when we're doing the chanting and bowing to the Buddha image, and this is like creating an idea of uh, what they call in, in theological circles, they, they call the, the thou, the I and thou. And so this is part of our um, uh, part of part of the way our minds work, okay, is through like a relationship with another, and we have to, uh, in our spiritual practice, we have to address that, okay. We can't sort of put it to one side. Part of our minds mean how do we relate to the other, and so we bring that into our spiritual practice as well. And part of the way we do that is through our devotional practices of doing the chanting, doing the bowing, making a beautiful shrine with a beautiful Buddha image and all of these kinds of things. And so in that sense, you know, we're, we're using those things, we're using those structures to help us. But of course those structures are all empty. Okay? And so we don't attribute to those things anything, any, any kind of meaning which is not... Um, uh, uh, not, not, um, not valid, or not, 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 uh, not justified. Just the meaning is what we bring to it, our own attitude to those things. So what we're actually bowing to is just emptiness. There's actually an absent Buddha. We're actually chanting those words, recalling an absent Buddha, and so the Buddha is all gone. It's completely gone. This is the uh, uh, ending of the Heart Sutra, sort of emphasizing that, almost, almost making it you know, into, into a mantra, gone, 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 beyond, gone completely beyond. And so our idea of the Buddha is so gone, he's so absent. And it's in appreciating that and in, in understanding that that we uh, have that letting go. We can make it, we can open ourselves up and bow down to that emptiness. Because that's where that sense of humility is. That sense of humility comes from. And I think very often we, again, as Buddhists or as a Buddhist community, we are a bit um, forgetful of this. 
and sometimes we tend to be a little bit um, conceited about our religion. I mean, there, there are many things to be conceited about. There's a, many wonderful aspects of Buddhist culture and philosophy and so on. So, you know, if we want to look at the good, good sides of that, then of course we can feel a sense of pride about it. But sometimes uh, I've heard from, from Buddhists and so on that they, they will say things like, oh, you know, other, other religions are just faith, there's no wisdom there. And Buddhism is the only religion that has wisdom. Well, that's obviously not true. Okay, every religion has its own wisdom, may not be the same as the Buddhist wisdom, but it's not true to say that they don't have their own wisdom. Or people will say that you know, the Buddhism is the only religion that teaches us to, to inquire uh, into, say, the meaning of our sacred scriptures. So I think you know, maybe there's something to that in the sense that perhaps the Buddha emphasized that more uh, and made it more explicit than we find in a lot of other religions. But still, if we look at the religious traditions from any religion, whether Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, that there's a tremendous history of inquiring and debating about the meaning of the sacred scriptures and their truth and their relevance and all of these kinds of things. So it's, it is the fact that those things have been going on for a long time and so on and so forth. These are just a couple of examples that come to mind. But there is a sense in which as Buddhists that we can get a bit conceited. We think that we've got the best religion or ours is the most modern religion. We say, okay, Albert Einstein said that Buddhism was the best religion for the modern age or the only religion for the modern age and these kinds of things. And uh, so we can get a bit conceited about it. Whereas, of course, the path of Buddhism is to not attach to any of those forms or contents of the religion, right? but to open ourselves up with that sense of humility that comes from understanding absence, comes from understanding impermanence, it comes from understanding emptiness. And so if we really want to uh, get into the truth, if we really want to submit to the Dhamma, and to let the Dhamma enter within us. We need to have that humility before the truth. And that's a very wonderful attitude to have in our meditation, to not approach meditation as if we know what we're doing or as if we just have to apply a particular meditation technique and the results will come automatically. But to, every time we sit, to make that something really special and to bring in this, what they, in, in, in Zen, of course, the beginner's mind is, of course, a great, what's that, the cliche of Zen meditation, but still very true. We sit down, we have that beginner's mind. I don't know anything. Every time you sit meditation, maybe you've been doing it for years. So I've been meditating for how long? 15 years or something now. And these are the Many of you maybe have been meditating longer than that. But these are the, the kinds of problems which you can have after you've been meditating for a long time is that you get uh, jaded. You, you, know, you think that one meditation will be like the next. And so you have to keep on reminding yourself, no, it's not like that. Each meditation is completely different. It has to be taken on its own terms. And so we, we open up to whatever that experience is and be very careful of allowing that, that, that kind of that uh, little knowledge, that very dangerous little knowledge from destroying our meditation, especially if we think, oh, meditation is like this. I'm this kind of meditator. I'm, I can do this kind of meditation. I can't do that kind of meditation. I'm a good meditator. I'm a bad meditator, and so on and so forth. And we let these things constrict the possibilities but the more we can open up, the more emptiness there is, the more possibility there is. Any kind of things that we have in our mind will always close off the door. They're always closing off the truth. The less things there are in the mind, the more it's open. The more truth can just happen within that. And so we bring that very, very um, 
trying to, we're trying to bring to meditation a very, very childish, very humble uh, uh, attitude. And so it is, it is very useful. Physically, we can embody that, practice that by bowing before we meditate, you know, go to the, to the shrine and bow very uh, sincerely, very humbly to the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha and really try to give up in doing that bowing, try to give up any sense of self or ego. And then just coming back and sitting... And just opening to whatever is, and opening especially to what is not. So we can do that, in, in some ways we can do that consciously within our meditation, looking for the gaps, looking for the spaces, and noticing that our mind is actually um, conditioned and constructed and dependent on the existence of those spaces. And in fact, you know, I, I'm sure if you if you wanted to look at it in that way, you could you could actually say that 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 we would be one of the definition of definitions of madness or descriptions of madness is where the spaces in the mind uh, aren't there anymore. One do, one doesn't have any um, room around uh, one's thoughts or intentions or anything, or one's moods. That one's just it's completely they're compressed and they're they're they're, they're they, they take you over. So the more space we have around these things, the easier they are, the better they're managed. And the more we can see something special out of something simple. And that's one of the things that we've learnt from different kinds of art, isn't it? You know, from, say, some kinds of Japanese art where they just, you know, just have a, a brush stroke or Chinese art, a very simple brush stroke and certain kinds of modern art as well, some of... Picasso's styles and different kinds of modern art, where you have a big open blank space and then just one brush stroke in that, or just a few brush strokes. It just suggests a kind of a shape or a color or a form. And that's given uh, definition by all the space around it. Or another, uh, of course, classic example of that is the Zen rock garden, where you have the kind of the, the raked sand which is sort of symbolizes the formlessness and the emptiness. And then arising out of that is a, a rock, which has a very definite shape and form. And of course, the rock is given um, a quality and made into something, not because of what it is, but because of being surrounded by what is not. So something very ordinary can become very special. So this is very, very much how it is in the mind. That, that by emptying out everything, then even, even simple, normal things take on some kind of special aura. We realize how amazing they are. So for example, like, like um, <clears throat> some... Just, again, just, just the one example off the top of my head is, is some kind, sometimes our, our ethical attitudes, okay? Maybe something that we take for granted. You know, so for example, we have an attitude of compassion. We, we, we like to help people and we're, we, we, we contract away from causing pain and suffering to others. We feel remorseful when we hurt others. And, and maybe we're just like that. Maybe we just do that and that's just who we are and we don't think about it too much. But when we have the space in our meditation, the mind's quiet. And then up in the mind comes this thought, maybe a thought of kindness or a thought of compassion. And we can really see that. You can really see the nature of that very clearly and very beautifully. And, and it's so uplifting. You can, sometimes you can be moved, literally be moved to tears just by a, a, a single, very, very simple thought. This is one of the things that happened to me during the, during the last rains retreat. And uh, we had three months in the monastery where we didn't go out of the monastery. And during that three months, we each had two weeks where we could just meditate and just stay in our 
hut and not, not see anybody or talk to anybody or anything. The food would be brought to us and we just uh, uh, meditate all day and night. And uh, during that time, uh, I, could, I began to, to experience this very, um, very deeply. And sometimes these, just these very simple uh, kind of emotional attitudes or, or ideas which would come up from time to time. And then you just see, you know, both the, the pain of, of if it was unwholesome ones, then of course you see the pain of that, the, the, the anger or the, the uh, hurt in that. And then when the good emotions would come up, you see the, the glory of it, the splendor. It's something that's extremely powerful and yet normally we don't, normally it's just part of a crowd or a rush of, of so many things in our minds that we don't see the specialness of it. But when it's given the space, it becomes so special. So we should never worry about absence and again, this is something which sometimes is used to criticize Buddhism. Buddhism's nihilistic. It's, you know, it just, it's just all about nothingness. It's all, you know, it just doesn't have any positive dimension. I mean, that's, that kind of criticism can be um, addressed on many different levels. But part, partly it's true. Partly it is true that Buddhists have a more mature attitude towards absence, towards letting go. And when something is not there, we're very happy to say that that's not there. That's not to say we're kind of fetishizing absence. We're not like trying to make everything go away and trying to make our mind this kind of barren desert of nothingness. Okay, So this is like a caricature. That's not what it means, of course. But it does mean that when things are not there, we appreciate that and we appreciate the space that it gives to what is there. And we realize that only when that seat is empty, only when we are not presented with the outward forms of the God or of the spiritual truth or of whatever you might want to be, how you might want to express it, but only when that outward presence is not there, is absent, do you really understand what that is. And it's at that moment that the heart opens up and it's at that moment that one becomes primed or ready for understanding to enter in. So this is my little talk for you this evening on the disappearing God. So hopefully maybe that's primed you a little bit for, the, uh, for tomorrow night's philosophy interfaith <coughs> discussion. And... Uh, I'd like to invite if anyone has any comments or questions about that.